Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome and thank you for coming. Uh, my name is David Lesher. I'm the editor and CEO of Cal Matters. Uh, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan news organization that was launched about three years ago in Sacramento. Our work is shared with media throughout California and it is intended to raise awareness about state policy issues and make the process more transparent and accountable. So a couple of thank yous. Uh, I certainly want to thank our panelists for joining us in this discussion today. I want to thank our sponsor, Ed Edison International, for helping us make this possible. And uh, we have many CalMatter staff here that I'd love to just, uh, if you could wave your hands, uh, Baranda on video and Priyanka and Trevor, our social media editor, and Elizabeth and Marsha Parker, our COO and uh, publisher. And of course, I'll introduce Julie here in a minute. And I think there's a couple others here too. Oh, Nas, of course. Nas out at the desk. So, so uh, quite a CalMatters team here. Um, we are very glad to be at the Global Climate Action Summit. Uh, climate policy has clearly been one of California's most impressive modern success stories. A goal was identified. I was covering uh, Sacramento for the LA Times when Senator uh, Pavley's AB 32 was passed. So um, a goal was identified, a consensus was reached, policy was implemented, and an ambitious goal was achieved. So now we have new goals. So as California hosts the world today, Today's event is intended to hear from some of the Californians most involved in this policy and what this state has done and why it should be a model for the world. So let me introduce our moderator, who will introduce our panelists. Julie Cart is a, a rock star in environmental journalism in California. <laughs> uh, she covered the environment for CalMatters for the past two years, focusing especially on the state's climate policies. Um, and she went with Governor Brown uh, last November to bond to the United Nations Climate Conference and uh, did coverage from there. Um, as she was at the previous to that, we took her from the Los Angeles Times, my alma mater as well, uh, where Julie worked for more than three decades, uh, including work as an environmental writer and a winner of the 2009 Pulitzer Prize for Environmental Reporting. So, so we're glad to have her, Cal Mares, and you're going to love uh, hearing her on this panel. So please welcome Julie Cart. Uh, if I do things right, you won't be hearing me on the panel. So let's hope that's, that's the way it works. Thank you all for being here. For a, a little nonprofit like CalMatters, this is a big deal. So um, you, you become big deals to us. So thank you so much. Um, could not be more delighted that these folks are here that you'll be hearing from. Is, is, I'm sorry, does that mean speak more loudly or? OK, I, I am such a big mouth. I'm kind of conscious of not being a bigger mouth. But very, very pleased to have these panelists here. These, these are folks who know these topics inside out and come from discrete parts of the environmental world. And, and uh, it's, it's so useful. Fran Pavley, who was uh, an assembly member and a senator representing parts of Los Angeles and Ventura, you know, present at the birth. She, she wrote the bill that we're, this is kind of the predicate for a lot of things we're talking about today. Uh, and many other pieces of legislation, um, but has a keen eye on environmental issues and has always had that interest. Michael Shaw, who's the vice president at the California Manufacturers and Technology Association, who represents manufacturing interests in Sacramento, and um, he's a steady and very incisive presence around the legislature who makes sure that, that, that those views get heard. Um, uh, and. Uh, obviously very important. And John White is the executive director of the Center for Energy Efficiency and Renewable Technologies. And I think of him as um, California's environmental diplomat. He has a knack for being able to find common ground between sometimes warring factions. And, and um, I, I'm not going to say you're calm, but <laughs> <laughs> he's a reasonable guy. Um, <laughs> Fran and I were on the same flight up here yesterday and started chatting about uh, the speed at which climate policy is changing uh, and you get whiplash trying to follow both state and certainly federal policy. Um, and that's kind of what we want to do here today is to trace um, where California has been and looking at the innovations that are so admired um, across the country and the world. Um, 
energy efficiency, automobile emission standards, and a carbon trading market, cap and trade. We also want to look and, and acknowledge um, missteps. And depending on your point of view, it could be all three of those things <laughs> I just mentioned are aspects of them. Um, we want to look forward um, without spending too much time looking back at, at what we, uh, I think, all agree is will be a very challenging future. Um, and we hope to have a candid, informative, and provocative discussion, uh, and a civil one, which would be a change. Um, and our panelists are very interested and in looking forward to your questions at the end, uh, which we find much more interesting than the drivel I can come up with, which is here. Um, so we will launch. Um, we are at an international climate change summit uh, where California and its governor is being held up as a model for progressive action, you know, the, the victory lap for Governor Brown. Um, Fran, is California a model? I mean, is, do you think that this is appropriate, that California is held up as, as uh, the arbiter of uh, climate taste and that we've done things right? Well, you're probably asking the wrong I know. person. <laughs> 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 Uh, so I'll start with yes, but let me share with you why I, maybe why I think that. Um, it's not so much about the details in our policies, but California is just in such a unique place with 40 million people and the purchasing power and uh, the ability to, when we pass these bills, create a market for investment and innovation in this state. So where I think we really done extremely well is through the technologies that have come out of either through the great work by our agencies, where we're second to none with the Air Resources Board and the California Energy Commission on building standards and appliances or the PUC on renewables. But the technologies that have come from California that have made a difference around the world are probably just as important as some of the policies. Mm. And What's been a surprise to me, I started on this environmental journey, is that California has really created these markets for businesses and jobs to locate here for a 21st century economy. And I'll give you a short story. I sat next to it, an air pollution conference, uh, engineer from China. And I said, oh, why are you here? And I, he said, we follow what your air resources board does. We come over here. We wouldn't have catalytic converters in our cars in China today if it wasn't for California. So I think those kinds of stories, uh, to me, is one of the real models there. We can tweak, obviously, our policies and make sure that they change with the times and reflect uh, cir particular circumstances. But uh, California should lead, and that's because of the investment and innovation in this new clean future. Yeah. Michael, we'll get into details um, about policies that, that some of us like and some don't. But you know, as writ large, do you think California is a model? So I feel like I'm in the middle here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> not the punching bag, necessarily, but I, I, because I think that the senator and, and, uh, and John over here are, are far, too, far too civil and polite. Uh, and, and, and I think thoughtful to do that. But the I, my answer, short answer to the question is yes and no. And, and I think the no comes in the details of some of those policies and how they interact or overlap uh, or are layered on top of each other. And I think that's where we get into the situation of things not working as well as they could as we don't go back and make changes to the old programs or get rid of the old programs when we're putting in new programs on top of it. So we end up with multiple programs on top of each other trying to attack the same issue. Uh, and in the same respect, we try and make things like the cap and trade program uh, or global or climate policy in general, try and tackle other environmental issues. And that is a challenge that we face because when we set a program to address one specific goal, a target, then we try and, on the back end, through the details of the policy, force it to do a bunch of other things. That becomes problematic. And that, then I think generally from an industry's perspective, uh, it is difficult when the California continues to push forward and the rest of the country, for the most part, and parts in some of the world is not following suit in the same respect. So that puts California out uh, and it puts industry at a little bit of a bit of bigger risk. John? 
You'd be on the optimistic side? Um, well, actually, I, I, I tend to think that Michael's right in the sense that um, we don't do enough <coughs> recalibrating um, when we have made an effort and then achieved the result. We don't necessarily go back and, and adjust. And, and I think it's important what Fran said earlier, the, the, the beginning of our leadership uh, on these issues goes back many years. I want to shout out to my friend Bill Simmons, who's a former executive officer of the California Air Resources Board in the 70s, oh. when we did some of the most important vehicle emissions work in the major Wilson administration, we did some important work on fuels. The ZEV mandate was actually adopted in 1990 under George McMajan, excuse me, uh, George McMajan's Air Resources Board. So, so the leadership comes from our air pollution experience. And I think to some extent, there is a little bit of uh, falling in love with the carbon mission when in fact the carbon mission is only <coughs> one part of the strategy that in the end we need across the board action to reduce not just carbon, but also oxides of nitrogen, particulates, air pollution, methane. One of the most disturbing things this week was that President Trump uh, abandoning the methane rules that the Obama administration adopted, which were clearly cost effective, clearly not a burden on industry, and clearly a really important pollutant. So I think the answer is yes, we're a model, but we shouldn't take that as grounds for self-congratulations so much as we have attempted to sketch out a plan that covers multiple sectors with different strategies. We have some market-based incentives. We have some command and control, or as I like to call it, direct regulation. Um, and, and yet thinking how these pieces fit together and then how do we adjust based on our success. For example, with the case of renewables, it's not about simply adding more kilowatt hours of solar anymore, right? We've done that. Okay, now what we have to do is use the renewables to run the grid and reduce our dependence on natural gas. Okay, that means more than simply throwing them onto the grid and seeing how many we can, we can provide. We, we've now got, to, so, so this is what I mean by recalibration, yeah. that we have demonstrated renewables are, are now cost effective. They can be deployed at large scale. We can permit them generally and, and interconnect them. But now that we've done that, the question is, how do we achieve the next round of objectives and how do we integrate that with the rest of the economy, including the affordability of electricity for all of our consumers and our businesses? We're going to have to keep on top of costs. The electrification of transportation provides an opportunity for that because if we increase electricity sales, it will help us absorb our renewable uh, output and at the same time, when we are using lower cost renewable energy to power the grid, that changes the feasibility of electrification more generally. Pardon? Use it. Yes, sir. <laughs> I have a few songs I'd like to sing. Um, we love John because at Cal Matters we're deeply wonky and there's no detail that's too fine for us. So thank you, John. Uh, Please continue. Uh, we have a number of legislators, California legis legislators here today. And Fran, I'm, I'm wondering if in the, the smoky rooms that I'm sure you inhabited when you no were smoke no smoky rooms, no. Okay, sorry. no emissions, fugitive emissions in those rooms. So when, when you all were discussing what was a broad and breathtaking step to take, which was the, the uh, climate change laws that you all wrote, um, did you really think you were launching something that would be successful? Or did you hope for a little bit? And I'm wondering if, if you look at um, the early adoption of renewable portfolios, um, the fact that the economy is doing well, um, either in spite of or because of these policies, and uh, there's adoption of electric vehicles. I mean, did you envision, when you all were talking about it, look, we, just, we better stick a flag out there and, and run toward it, or did you actually think it would work, and are you surprised by some of the success? Please use this. I would be glad to use that. Thank you very much. I was going to use my teacher's voice from yeah. the back of the room, but now I don't have to do that. I appreciate it. So it has been an amazing success story, but I agree, Michael and John, you have to stop, look back, see what needs to be updated, not duplicated or mm -hmm. isn't 
it doesn't make sense anymore. And that's always uh, part of the job of the legislature to providing, providing oversight. So there are several legislators in the room, right? Yeah. You know who you are. Bob Hertzberg, <laughs> yay. Um, um, I saw Hannah Beth Jackson earlier. Yeah. Scott Weiner, state senator, his district, where is he? Oh, yep, there's Scott, he's usually, and there was someone, Ricardo oh, Ricardo. Ricardo, super pollutant hero, Mr. <laughs> super pollutant. And, and Bill Wood from Santa Rosa. Jim Wood. And, and Jim Wood, Jim thank Grayson. you. Jim Grayson. Okay. Oh, you go ahead. Oh, and uh, Senator Grayson, Jim Grayson in the back. See, some I haven't served with, so that, yeah. Yeah. it's, you know, we have term limits in California. Um, <laughs> Is that a question? No, turn on it. Um, so, so in many cases, we we pass this legislation for all the right reasons, and in my, in most cases, it turned out and exceeded my expectations. Mm. For example, I'll just give you two examples: renewable energy, twenty percent. It was a bill by Senator Shear in two thousand and two. You could not get that bill out of the assembly committee. I was brought in from another committee to replace someone on the committee because I would stand up to the utilities and say, you know, I think we can get to 20% renewable energy and um, creating that market signal was going to be good for California. But here's why we did it, not only just from climate change perspective in 2002, we had just gone through energy deregulation. And one lesson from that was, I am not going to be gamed by out-of-state energy providers when we create in-state jobs and have control of our economic future. So yes, it was an environmental thing. So what was the surprise outcome from that, I would say? By the time we got to 33% and Joe Sumidian had a bill, all the utilities were supporting it after opposing the first one. Why? Because they saw they could do this, and also the market signal created a demand and brought the price of photovoltaic cells down. It became cost effective. I always measure everything lots of times from the middle class background I have. Average people now could get solar panels, either through a lending program or a buying program. That's been a successful. 500,000 jobs in the renewable and um, energy efficiency space. Uh, in California have been as a result of some of these policies. So that has been good. Automobiles was the biggest fight. That's harder. And California has to, for air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions, focus on mobile sources. Get people out of their cars, but we looked also at the tailpipe of automobiles, which we can do under the Federal Clean Air Act to reduce for emissions. Now. For now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it was such a nice <clears throat> event till then. Um, and so uh, everyone said that was a job killer. No one would ever be able to drive the cars they wanted to drive. They were unsafe. We had uh, protests everywhere, full page ads, commercials. Cal Worthington. Cal Worthington is dark Ooh. spot. John and Ken on conservative talk show radio leading an SUV motorcade around the Capitol. The hundreds and hundreds of cars to every legislator's office. My friends in the Republican Party taking breaks during the vote on the bill to go across the street and be on the John and Ken show, urging people to, anyway, uh, reliving that. Uh, the bill passed, so what was the result of that bill? Uh, yes, other states adopted it. Look at the automobile manufacturers today. How are they doing? They said they would never be able to compete with this kind of legislation. Do you see a lot broader choice of vehicles? Yes, pickup trucks, yes SUVs, passenger cars, and a broad array of alternative fuel vehicles. There wasn't electric cars and hybrid cars back then. So they have to comply with a fleet average. So Ford Motor, you do your pickup trucks, but you do the others. But the hidden success story is, yes, we want them to be successful, because that's always my goal. I want business to be successful, but I also want the environmental dividends that come with it. Does it reduce air pollution overall? Yes. Greenhouse gas emissions? Yes. By create, um, do you save money at the pump with more fuel efficiency? Yes. And the public? 
time and time again to the PPIC polls, it's good that we're here, shows every July that the public supports these policies because they do all of the above. So I think that's been a success story. Yes, there are problems. I'm sure there'll be a question on that. But um, those Probably two examples. <laughs> Probably from this guy here. Probably from this guy here. So yeah, it, so job, the, 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 it was a job killer bill too. I have to say, all these were job killer bills. Yeah, and that, that would be the, that would be the California Chamber of Commerce's uh, list of, of bills. Yeah, the uh, yeah. So from the manufacturer's perspective, I mean, I, I think you know it, it bears note that that there have California industry uh, manufacturers in general, you know, have risen to the challenge on a lot of these things, and and that is. Certainly, something that we can't overlook is their creativity and ingenuity. I would also point out that the cost of fuel, the cost of electricity, is significantly higher than it is elsewhere. You know, for manufacturers, we're paying 86% higher for electricity prices than the national average. We're paying double what our neighboring states, what our, ma our manufacturers in neighboring states would be paying for electricity. And so, while we're forced to be uh, to, to be creative and to, to seek out greater levels of efficiency, at some point that investment in getting those greater levels of efficiency becomes in and of itself a challenge and a disincentive to invest in California. And we've seen that show up in economic growth related to manufacturing specifically because we do lag behind the rest of the country in creating middle class uh, building manufacturing jobs. So there are challenges you know, that, that do come from that. And it's not to say that we don't pursue some of those things, uh, some of those policies that, that the good senator has pointed out, but it is something that we do need to bear note of. And, and, and as you mentioned, cost effectiveness is something that needs to be uh, considered as well. At what, what, at what cost do these goals come? And uh, as I think John mentioned earlier, um, in kind of reiterating, I think, a theme here, is we need to go back and recalibrate and take a look at what we've done and determine whether or not that continues to make sense to do. Because if what happens when we layer programs on top of programs is we get, we're, we're trying to hit the same thing several times over, and that just makes that particular element more expensive. We have also seen that a lot of the manufacturing of these, you know, photovoltaic cells and other technologies is occurring, but it's occurring in other states and other countries. We do a lot of research and development in California, and we get a lot of those science and technology jobs, the, the high-paying jobs up there at the six-figure-plus range that require advanced degrees. We've also grown, seen a lot of growth in the low end into the service sector, uh, where the wages and benefits are not as great and we're seeing a hollowing out in the middle. And so when we look at these policies, we need to be looking at, I think, as, as the senator mentioned, middle class you know, upbringing, we need to be looking at the middle and saying, how is this affecting those folks? And then you mentioned that you do that. But the cost of those goods related to these policies is something that we, it does impact those people, it does impact their economic uh, prospects in the future. <coughs> And that is something that we are primarily focused on. Does that mean, again, we don't do anything? No, but it means that we have to consider those impacts. We need to find ways to make sure that manufacturers can grow here. Because if we're doing it here, as Next10 you know, has continually found in their reports looking at California's green and energy efficiency, California is very green, it's very energy efficient, so that's something that we should pursue and promote. We need to get that manufacturing happening here and not happening elsewhere. Because then we get the bang, double the bang for the buck on the environmental aspects of the policy, but we also get the economic benefits that go along with that. And so I think I went a little bit further afield, but uh, wanted to make sure we got the broad perspective on that. Um, picking up on that point, I think one of the areas that we need to recalibrate uh, in our policies is, is how valuable energy efficiency actually is. Mm. One of the things that we've seen in our regulatory process is a tendency to sometimes micromanage the programs. I, Senator Hertzberg had a bill where basically said that the PUC couldn't second guess uh, after they had approved a, a, a commercial energy efficiency project uh, and say, well, no, it, it costs more and it's worth less, and so we're going to change our mind. And so, so, so when we're getting people to do the things we want, we have to understand the importance of certainty. The other thing I think is, as the grid is now changing, we're seeing the economics of the electricity are changing. So suddenly, in the middle of the day, we have a surplus and an abundance, and we're not talking about matinee prices to encourage people, like going to the movies on the afternoon, encourage people to preheat, pre-cool, 
uh, user energy, the other area that's very important is demand response. Because when we have this uh, abundance of electricity in the middle of the day, we need to move the consumption closer to that generation. And then at the same time, try to move people off the grid when the sun goes down and the price of energy goes back up. This is where storage becomes important, and not just batteries. We need to look at all forms of storage, large scale, long duration. And these are things where I think we can maybe cushion the blow and make things work more affordably for our manufacturers at the same time while staying on track to meet our goals. So, I, so this is an example of where I think, uh, for example, at the PC, the value of energy efficiency now, when we're talking about avoiding uh, uh, natural gas consumption from Elise O'Kanan, that's it's, it's worth buying and paying more. And yet the, the PUC stuff has this opinion of, well, we know what cost effectiveness is, and, and this isn't it. And this is why you get second guessing when the business community, look, at the business community is investing in a project because it's more efficient, I think we've got to be careful not to second guess them and say, well, you know, it's really not efficient enough or it does, it's not cost effective enough after they've already made the investment. That's the kind of thing that drives people crazy and makes us look silly in terms of us being a place to do business. And just really quickly to read, John said, uh, we hope Governor uh, Brown signs uh, Senator Hertzberg's bill on energy efficiency projects for commercial industrial folks because it will make a big difference in that certainty aspect. I asked Julie if it was okay if I jump back in here because sometimes it's hard to go first. <laughs> sometimes. Um, I, I always think about um, why are we here this week? What's the cost of doing nothing? We can find tweaks we need to make. Yes, we need to do this better, but frankly, we need to double down on what we're doing and reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and we need all Californians to step up into the plate to their communities, their businesses, your homes, and figure out collectively what we can do. Um, it, it's not a theoretical discussion anymore. We have to be smart, but there needs to be a sense of urgency. So one thing I always reflected on, what is the cost of doing nothing? Let's just forget all this. The cost of doing nothing. Do, do we like the way the climate's going and everything's going um, around our country and around the world? It scares me. I, these uh, impacts of climate change, I didn't think I'd see in my lifetime. In 2001, we had UCS reports. We did hearings everywhere oh, about wildfires and volatility of snowpack, and the list goes on and on. Whatever was in that report in 2000, it's triple that, the impacts now. So I feel a sense of urgency, and it's a collective responsibility. And I want to hear from all sectors, business sector, what they can do, given the realities. And I appreciate the bottom line and everything. But one reason, for example, um, cost of fuel so high because every time we do anything on cars, it's you're just increasing gas prices. I don't know about you, but I've seen gas prices where I live within 20 miles of each other, a dollar fifty apart. Four fifty nine a gallon, three twenty five a gallon, same chain, right. seventy six or whatever it is, and it's really sort of a manipulation of some market signals. Yes, it's supply and demand. Got it. It's some sales tax that like 5% of the total is from the gas price increase, but you would think all of it was from the gas price increase. It's some on fuel blends, so we don't have as much smog in the air. But a lot of it is manipulation in the marketplace when you see that huge discrepancy. Why is it a dollar and a half cheaper in Sacramento than LA? No real reason. It's, it's sort of... Uh, uh, a free economy market system, you, if whatever you can sell, you can sell at any price and people will buy it. So we need to create some competition in the fuel sector to drive down prices, lower carbon fuels, EVs, and the list goes on so there's no monopoly on it and it's our number one source of greenhouse gas emissions. So I guess my comment is we have a lot of work to do and I look forward to working with everyone from their different perspectives, but we have to do something.
not just undo what we've done. You know, that's a good point, Fran, because I don't hear um, your folks, Michael, saying let's not do nothing. I mean, the, in fact, a lot of uh, response to climate change impacts is, is really uh, being propped up by the promise of technology. We're hoping that there will be these breakthroughs that, that we can rely on. So it's your guys. Um, can you talk about, um, isn't that a business opportunity, not to be too, too cynical here, but rather than feeling like you're being lashed by the command and control whip, you, you actually are being nudged into you, the folks you represent, are, are being nudged into an arena where there's a lot of dough to be made. <laughs> there, there certainly is potential there, and as I mentioned earlier, there is a lot of research and development occurring in California. We tend to see the production shift to other states and other, other countries, and that's one of the challenges that we think the policies need to take into greater account. Not just California leading the way in research and development, but California leading the way in actually producing those goods that are going to help contribute to that. And there are examples. I mean, there's a, a company that's developing a, uh, I think, a, it's an ethanol-based fuel uh, additive, you know, in and down in, in the Central Valley, San Joaquin Valley, you know, that uh, is supposed to be carbon negative, um, you know, which, which would be a tremendous benefit, right? That's occurring in California. Uh, but we see a lot of the production of solar, you know, photovoltaic cells, and battery production, other things like that occurring outside of California. We do the research and development. You know, thankfully we have companies like Tesla that are doing the manufacturing of their vehicles here, but even they chose to locate their battery production facility in Nevada for a variety of reasons, and some of that has to do with other policies that California has in place. But we need to be looking at those, those issues as well, because otherwise we miss out on that other significant benefit that comes along with that. But companies are responding because they have to have, they want to have access to the market. In some cases, they need to be close to that market. In other cases, they can simply locate in another state and, frankly, truck uh, or train, you know, their goods into the state or ship them overseas, you know, on a big container ship. So there's different opportunities to meet the demand in California. Uh, we would love to see that happen production-wise in this state and not just the, the, the goals being set here the mandates being imposed on our companies, but also the opportunity to be here for them to do that work in the state. John, you, you run a shop that has the word technology in its title. So what, what's exciting to you in terms of uh, coming to the rescue, uh, at least for some mitigation for some of these problems? Um, well, I, I, I'm excited by the, the different combinations of technologies and practices that we can uh, avail ourselves of. Uh, uh, one of the things uh, that the, the drop in the cost of battery technology has enabled there to be new demand response programs that involve shifting customers' load to avoid demand charges and high costs in the afternoon through the deployment of a battery and, and, and an internal sort of dynamic where the customer is indifferent the energy use doesn't change, just where it comes from. So I think that's a very, I think demand response and batteries together could provide some very important opportunities to reduce uh, local capacity requirements and natural gas. The other thing that I think uh, that's exciting is is in the in the geothermal uh, area down in Imperial County, there's a, a significant opportunity for lithium production mm. coming out of the geothermal brine. And this is, lithium is a product that is going to, along with cobalt, be in very important supply to fulfill our battery demands. And the current production of, of, uh, of lithium um, is, and cobalt are, are both uh, <coughs> mining and environmentally intensive and you know, have problems with labor. So, so that could be an important revenue stream. Geothermal is a more expensive resource, but if they had a second revenue stream associated with the lithium, I think that'd be good. Last thing I want to say is that I think we need to recognize how much more demand for cooling there's going to be. If you look at the temperature adaptation stuff, city of San Francisco, nobody had air conditioning. There's other parts of California that because it's getting so hot, we're getting more air conditioning. Uh, uh, deployed and, and air conditioning systems are at the moment a lot of them are old they're inefficient they got fluorocarbon so I'm, I'm wondering instead of just a million solar roofs how about a million new high efficiency low CFC air conditioners 
as a goal. Now, air conditioning is a little, it's not as sexy as batteries and stuff like that, but, but it's fundamental to the quality of our life going forward. And we're going to have to be able to have more cooling with less energy consumption and more availability. The other thing I worry about is affordability in the inland parts of the state. You know, the Bay Area and the coastal California is doing fine, but the areas in the Central Valley have very high heat uh, and relatively low economic <coughs> prosperity and relatively high bills. Okay, so this is an example where I think we need some targeted focus uh, in delivering the benefits of cooling and environmental performance into these low-income communities. Yeah, I think the, the whole component of environmental justice is, is huge. And in California, if you, if you think about uh, access to cooling centers or being able to be, live in your home, um, and you think about climate refugees, they're not in sub-Saharan Africa, they're here. I mean, we have a huge Mojave Desert that will become unsustainable um, if it isn't already. Uh, if you want to, my mom lives in Arizona where on her fixed income, she may spend 500 bucks a month to cool her home, which is not large, and she's not talking about you know, wearing a little cardigan to get it down to that level. So it's very profound, you're right. That something, speaking of profound, I have professional segues that I've written down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, da -da. Uh, lost in the announcements uh, in these last few days is something that is rather monumental. I don't know if we've all had a chance to get our minds around it, but the governor signed an executive order that requires the state to be uh, carbon neutral by 2045, which is something quite apart from 100% clean energy. This, this touches every aspect of our economy. So Michael, I'm looking at you out of the side of my eye. <laughs> this is very profound. Uh, it uh, is a very profound benchmark that is inspiring, I'm sure, to many. But the, the devil in the detail aspect um, is really interesting as well, and uh, I'd, I'd love to hear what, if you've had a chance to digest it at all. It's, it's a pretty big deal. It is tremendously huge uh, because it is, as you point out, far beyond 100% renewable energy. It's frankly beyond 100% uh, reducing our, or reducing our emissions by 100% below 1990 levels. We're talking about going at, to at least 100%, if not more. And you, keeping everything in, in, in perspective, California is about 1% of global emissions. We could literally shut down everything in the state, people out, animals out. We wouldn't make a dent in global climate change on our own. That's part of what the conference is about this week, is setting a global example. So we need to do it in a way that, uh, that everybody can come on board with that. So setting a goal. Uh, and this is, I guess, gets to a bit of the uncertainty that business feels is when is it good enough? We, we had a goal set in AB 32. Uh, we set a new goal in SB 32, you know, shortly thereafter. And we're now talking about setting yet another goal. We haven't even gotten, you know, but a, a couple of years into the, the most recent goal. And we're talking about pushing beyond that. And businesses are seeing the, seeing the dollar signs just continue to just kind of go up and up and just explode here. And now we talk about 100% or more you know, to get to carbon neutrality. Those are great goals. And while the governor's executive order lives as long as anybody wants to leave it in place, you know, I don't think the next governor, you know, if it's Governor, uh, governor Newsom, you know, would be likely to remove that. That's a potentially very significant issue for businesses and a disincentive for locating in California because, again, yet again, you can produce that good somewhere else and ship it into California. And in that case, we have shifted that production to an environment that is less concerned about the impact to global climate change, less concerned about the impact to environmental justice uh, communities, less concerned about being energy efficient. And so that's when, when industry looks at it, that's what we see. We see those things. Now, some will see an opportunity and some will locate here in California because of that, because they want to be at the epicenter of where this policy is taking place. And, and that, those, are, those are certainly some marginal benefits that can't be ignored. But I think the important thing to keep in mind is industry writ large is going to look at the cost and they're going to make decisions based on where they can get that return on investment. And if they can access the California market and produce at a lower cost somewhere else, I think they would be foolish to, to not take advantage of that. John? Um, I think that's, that's the downside. Um, 
uh, of, of setting ambitions goal is creating more uncertainty and perceived more financial risk. But the upside is that um, one of the things that we've learned in our experience is that the technology development and economics are not fixed and finite. Things that we thought were going to end up being more expensive have turned out not to be so. So I think the key is to not just set goals, but to have pathways that we can follow. For example, implicit in the governor's goal is the importance of reducing the emissions from heating and cooling in buildings. Okay? This is an opportunity for new technologies and saving of money. So I, th I think when we assume that it's going to cost a ton, that's true if everything stays the same. But part of the goal of some of our policies should be twofold. One is to make <coughs> the, policy, the technologies that we need and are strategic affordable. And that includes financing, but it also includes getting to scale. The second thing is, uh, is as I think Michael has suggested, is we got to get other people to follow us. Okay, we, we have got to have, um, we can't have so much complexity in our regulations and in our policies that other people uh, look at us and say, well, that's fine, but it's not, it's not going to fly here. We, we have a potential alignment on the West Coast between Oregon, Washington, Nevada, maybe even Arizona. There's a proposition on the November ballot in Arizona for 100% clean energy or something like that, and there's an initiative in Nevada. Being opposed uh, by their so, utilities. So, so, so I think, you know, in transportation, buildings, and electricity, having our policies be both affordable and replicable uh, will be important in terms of not just having us act in isolation, but having us uh, have a template that, that makes sense for people to follow. And that's where we get back to having to recalibrate right. what we're doing in a way based on our experience, but also with a mind of creating opportunities for others to follow in our pathway and for our companies and businesses not to be islanded in a high cost environmentally you know, intense place that nobody else is following and the technologies aren't being deployed in other places. Yeah. Fran, could you have imagined a 100% carbon neutrality bill ever getting out of uh, the legislature that you were part of? Understanding what it means, how profound it is? I would like to say it would be interesting for the future legislature to put it <laughs> in the statute because I'm Probably a firm believer. <laughs> I've gone through, uh, whether it was the tailpipe emission bill, all governors prefer things in executive orders because sure. they can change them, negotiate with them. They're very fluid, right? I like putting things in statute, and most businesses say they want the certainty and they want the market signal, and they, then, frankly, the legislature to get out of the way and let you go about doing your yeah. business. So that would be an interesting <laughs> test. On um, whether that because it's so futuristic, and when I um, authored AB 32, those were Governor Schwarzenegger's midterm targets: the reduction to 1990 levels by 2020. We have met those. Those are the midterm targets. He had aspirational executive order 80 percent reduction by 2050 targets that he put into place, and I said, you know. I'm going to do the midterm targets because I could look with people in a straight face and see pathways to get there. And also, we had some off ramps if the economy went south. Or, and also, the legislature, by putting it in statute, there is no law that says you can't go back and revisit a bill. Not just add on, but you can change it and modify it. Um, so that's why the initiative process is dangerous. So I'm a firm believer in putting things in statute. It gives the enforceability. It sends a stronger market signal. Businesses usually agree with me on that and that they know it's going to be in place. Um, so hopefully, uh, I think that discussion should be had, but I'm sure CARB and the CEC and PUC, they will have multiple, multiple workshop, workshops and stakeholder things figuring out how do you transition there? How do you how do you do that on top of top of all I wonder this? If they would they would label the workshop freak out because we don't know how to do this. But I, I, yeah, I, I, and and so when AB thirty two is around, I didn't want to even attempt an eighty percent because you can't predict what that future is like as far as how to get there. Right. But we met and exceeded those. And what? How do we get to SB thirty two now? Most people will tell you. 
we've got to refocus on super pollutants. We've sort of been ignoring them. If Ricardo Lara is left, he would like that shout out for super pollutants. 